Um, thank everybody for attending. This is going to be a very uh, informative lecture, I'm sure. Uh, and it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Ms. Katie Wagner. Uh, she is the president and founder of Katie Wagner Social Media, which specializes in content cre creation and management of social media for her clients. She has 15 years experience as a television and radio journalist. Uh, for media organizations such as ABC, CBS, CNN, and NPR. Along with running her own social media agency, Ms. Wagner is on the advisory board for WebWise Kids, a nonprofit organization focused on keeping children safe on the internet and social media. In 2012, she was awarded the organization's uh, Champion for Children Award. She is also a mentor at Chapman University's MBA program and is an entrepreneur in residence at the Leatherby uh, Center for Entrepreneurship. As Tom said, the title of her presentation today is LinkedIn Connections, Conversations, and Credibility, which um, is going to be very interesting and could be applicable for all of us. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Katie Wagner. Katie. Now you know that when you meet somebody, a lot of times we go and Google them and we check them out on social media. So this can be a really powerful place for you to showcase your expertise. Tell people about yourself, what your strengths are, what you're trying to do with your career. And most importantly, it's a place for community feedback. I want you to think about the other ways we communicate about ourselves. Um, a resume maybe, or maybe you have a personal website. I have a resume. It says all kinds of really nice things about me. You know why? because I wrote them, <laughs> right? And people know that when I hand them my resume, I put out everything that's on that piece of paper. But if you were to go to my social media channels and check out my LinkedIn profile or even my Facebook page or my Twitter, other people weigh in there. They say things about me there that I can't control, right? I get recommendations or comments on my Facebook page. And so when you're looking at somebody on social media, you're really getting that unbiased community view, right? You're getting a lot of feedback, and that helps build tr trust. So that's why it's important. We know that social media has changed business communications in a lot of ways. The first is immediacy. Think about how you used to get in touch with your friends or your business connections. You know, you'd call them or send them an email and wait for them to write back. These days, you can tweet or send them a Facebook message or connect with them on LinkedIn. And there's that level of immediate concern and conversation that you can tap into. It also works with businesses that you follow, right? If you have a question for a business, you can contact them on social media and get a much faster response. Social media has given us a greater degree of access, right? Let's say that I wanted to get to know Dr. Herbert, your dean. Well, in the old days, I would have to call here and ask to speak to him and explain who I was and hope they let me through. These days, I could look him up on LinkedIn and send him a connection request, right? I have that access to anybody I want to find just by using these channels. And social media gives us a greater degree of connection because when I look Dr. Herbert up, I can tell who we have in common, you know, who are the people that he knows that I know. Maybe he supports a nonprofit that I'm also into, or we went to the same college, right? There are things that I can deduce about him that weren't readily available to me before. And I can find that level of connection. It gives me an opening when I call him, right? And it gives us a greater degree of research. You all know that when you meet somebody new, maybe you take their business card and um, Google them, right? Most of us do that. We check out each other out. Maybe you checked me out before you came to this lecture today. And so there's a lot of research that can be done online that didn't used to be available to us. So I want you to understand a concept called social proof. And social proof basically means in situations where you don't know what you're doing, you assume everyone else is right. Okay, think about that. It's a psychological phenomenon. So we assume that everybody else knows more than us in any given situation. It's just human nature. And it's the reason why if you're thinking about doing business with a company and you're not sure, but then you read the testimonials or the reviews or case studies, you feel slightly better about it. Because if somebody else has done business with them and it worked out okay, it must be all right. It's also the reason that if you were looking for a social media consultant, let's say, and you pulled up my LinkedIn profile and you pulled up someone else's, Bob's LinkedIn profile, 
And Bob and I have the exact same skills and expertise, but I have a lot of endorsements and recommendations saying I'm good at my job, and Bob has none. Which one of us do you think is more qualified? Me, right? Automatically me. It's just human nature. It doesn't matter if I am or not. But we look to others to tell us the right situation, right? The right thing in any situation. So this is going to be an important concept to understand as we talk about LinkedIn today. Social proof. And because social media builds that social proof, builds that credibility for people, it's establishing what marketers sometimes call the no like and trust factor, right? And so when people come to get to know you from social media, they start with things like your LinkedIn or your Facebook or your Twitter, social media shortens the sales cycle by 40%. Now, think about what that means. Maybe it doesn't mean you're selling something. Maybe it means they're going to hire you for a job or they're going to give you a reference, right? But what this is really saying is they're 40% closer to closing the deal with you because they are warm leads at that point, right? If somebody has checked me out on my LinkedIn and knows all about me and then asked me to come to speak to their organization, they're doing it because they know something about me, right? Rather than just Googling and saying, ah, who can talk about social media? Click, I'll pick her, right? So social media is important because it makes that relationship faster. So today we're going to talk about LinkedIn. LinkedIn's the world's largest professional network, online or offline. It has about 250 million users, but there's a plus there because it grows every day. About half the users are male, half are female. Almost half are over the age of 45. Almost 90% have completed some college. And about 70% make over $50,000 a year. So this is a wealthy, educated population. This is a business network, right? LinkedIn is the most business friendly of any of the social media. It's the less, least social and most business appropriate. And here's what the, the founder of LinkedIn says about it. Reid Hoffman is the guy who created LinkedIn. And he says, we are a screwdriver in a world where people don't quite understand screws. And he says that because out of those 250 million people, Reed says that less than 3% use this tool the way he intended it to be used. Because most people think of LinkedIn as an online resume, right? I fill out the profile, everything's good, and I don't have to do anything else. And that's actually not what he intended. Because LinkedIn can be used for a lot of things. It can, yes, establish your online presence, right? It can be an online resume, and that's important. It can work to build your credibility. But LinkedIn is also a source of news in your industry. They have a news magazine built right into the program. It's a place where you can manage relationships, right? In business, we talk about customer relationship management, but this could be job relationship management or colleagues. You can track your relationships with people right inside this program. And we'll talk about how to do that today. And it's also a place uh, for business intelligence. If you want to do research about a certain product or service or a company, or you want to get referrals or do some prospecting, this is a great place to do that. And we're gonna learn how to do all of those things today. But the first thing we have to do is set up your profile. And we're gonna go through each blank because there's some important things for you to know when you're setting up your profile. And the first thing that I want you to remember is when somebody Googles your name, your LinkedIn profile will always come up first, every time. Doesn't matter if you filled out your profile or if it looks the way you want it to look or not, it will always come up first because of the way the LinkedIn algorithm works with Google. Google loves LinkedIn. So this is an important place to establish a presence online because it is somewhere where you're going to be found. If somebody has your business card or your resume or knows your name, they'll be able to find you on LinkedIn. And when they find you, you want it to be somewhere that you really build credibility, that they look at your profile and say, yes, this person knows what they're talking about. So let's talk about how to set up that profile. This is the top part of mine. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is the headline or title. And that's that line right under my name there at the top of the screen. It says social media management, social media strategy, trainer, and speaker. Now, my actual job title is president at Katie Wagner Social Media. But I don't put that in that line. And there's a very specific reason. Because LinkedIn, when it's pulling profiles to show up in search results, pulls first from that line. 
So it's looking for words in that headline or title to, sh to decide where you show up in search results. So as much as I hope that everyone's searching for the president of Katie Wagner Social Media, it's probably not happening. They might be searching for somebody to help with social media management, strategy, or training and speaking. So you need to make sure that whatever you write in that line is descriptive about your areas of expertise. Because when somebody's searching for somebody with those skills, you want LinkedIn to know to pull your profile up. The next thing I want you to notice is the profile URL. It's right under my red dress there. It's a little line. And that's the URL you use to get to my LinkedIn profile. And it says linkedin.com slash KW social media. Now, when I first set up this profile, it said LinkedIn slash in slash whole bunch of numbers and letters, right? That's a custom URL that I had to set myself. And I want you to set a custom URL because we want it to be short and pretty and easy to put places. I take that URL and it's on my business cards. It's in my email signature. It's on any printed collateral or brochures I hand out. It's on my resume, right? You want people to find this profile. And so the ideal way to set that URL is with your name. But there happen to be a million Katie Wagners in the world, so my name was already taken. So I branded it with my business. Um, you're welcome to use a middle initial or a number after your name, any way that you can make it work. But you want it to be recognizable to people, which means my real name, don't tell anybody, is Mary Catherine. But I don't use Mary Catherine Wagner because people don't know me that way. They know Katie. So if you're Christopher, or if you're Chris, go by Chris, you don't want to use Christopher on your LinkedIn, right? You want this to reflect what people actually call you. Okay? So when you're doing your URL, think about that. Think about what the name on your profile is and what's going to work for people to recognize you. The third bullet says you have to have a professional photo. You all know that. This is not the place to cut yourself out of the Christmas photo or the picture with your dog, right? And it doesn't have to be a professional headshot. You could stand against a blank wall and have somebody take your picture, and that works fine. But I want you to take a photograph specifically for this purpose, and you'll see that the way the profile looks, a white background or a light-colored background works great. You want your profile to be 100% complete. Now, this screenshot doesn't show it all, but if you were look to look to the right-hand side of the screen and a little farther down from where this screenshot was taken, you would see on your LinkedIn profile something that looks like a fishbowl. It would be a circle, and it has a water line on it showing how full your fishbowl is. And you want that fishbowl fish to be as full as possible because you want your profile to be 100% complete. Because when it gets to that level of completeness, LinkedIn will bump you into a higher search bracket, which means you will show up more often and higher in searches. Okay? So f sit down, take a couple of hours, and go through and fill out that profile completely to get the most out of it. Now, as you're filling it out, you want to think about the keywords that people are searching for that they're going to pull up your profile with. The first keywords we talked about are in that headline or title at the top of the screen. But there's one more place where keywords are important, and that's in your skills and expertise section. So as you list your skills on your LinkedIn profile, think about what people would be searching for to find you. And then lastly, make sure you fill out your contact information. You'll see the button on the lower right-hand side of this screenshot. And the contact information is important because sometimes if you're not connected to somebody on LinkedIn, they can't necessarily shoot you a question or um, connect with you there if you're too far away in your network. So you want to make sure that they have your contact information because if somebody wants to talk to you further, you want to make that as easy as possible for them. And I go so far as when I fill out my summary section, which is this one, I put my contact information at the bottom of the screen. So you'll see that I've written a summary about myself here. This is the next section down on your LinkedIn profile underneath the screenshot we just saw. And it says at the bottom, Katie can be reached at, and that's my phone number and my email. So even if they're not connected to me on LinkedIn, I want to put this contact information in places where I know that they can find me. And as you're filling out this summary section, you can write in first or third person. I write in third person because it's easier for me to say nice things about me that way. <laughs> but you can do it whichever way you're comfortable with. And I want this to be about you. Not your job, not your work history, not the company you 
affiliate with, I want it to be about you and what you bring to the table. So that if I changed jobs tomorrow, this section could remain unchanged. It's still about me and what I bring to the table in my next role. So I want you to highlight your general skills and expertise, and you'll see that my summary section is pretty short. You could make it a little longer than this. There's no right or wrong. But what I don't want is for you to have, you know, six or seven paragraphs there because you want people to see the rest of your profile. You want them to be able to scroll down and see some other things about you. And if you bog them down in this top summary section, they're going to lose interest before they scroll down. So make it short and digestible and easy to get the most out of. The next section down is your experience section. And this is where you're going to talk about your specific jobs. Okay, so this is company specifics. And you're going to talk in each listing about your role in that company. Right? A little bit about the company itself maybe, but then about your role. And again, just a short paragraph on each. People often ask, when I'm looking for a job, how many jobs do I list on my LinkedIn profile? What types of jobs do I put there? Is this a place where I put everything I've ever done so that people know everything leading up to this moment? And I would say, no, not necessarily. So you want to tailor the jobs you list to the type of work you're trying to be hired for, right? To the type of work you're going after now. So if you want to get into, let's say, a law firm, you want to go be a partner in a law firm or an associate, you don't need to necessarily list your uh, lifeguarding job unless you think those skills are transferable and you can explain that in your summary section here. Right? You want to list any jobs you've had interning at a law firm or being a, a legal clerk, maybe. But you want to tailor it. So for instance, I was a television anchor for 15 years before I went into social media. And if you looked right below this screenshot, that's where it mentions my television. It's the third job there. And I didn't list every station I've ever worked for. I listed them together. I said I was a television anchor for 15 years. And that's all I put. Because I'm not trying to be a television anchor today. I want to be in social media. And so the jobs that I elaborate on are my social media jobs. Now let's say that I decided tomorrow I want to go work for TV, and I'm done with social media. That won't happen, so don't panic. But, <laughs> but just in case, I would probably combine these two, minimize them, and list every TV job I've ever had, right? Because I'm tailoring my profile to what I want people to see about me, what I want them to know, and, and what experience I want to emphasize, okay? It is not necessary to list everything you've ever done, but think about what will make your case for the job you want next. There are two places on your LinkedIn profile where you can add media. And this is sort of your show and tell section, right? What constitutes as media? Maybe it's a link to your resume. It could be a document or a PDF. It could be a video or a photograph, right? Any of those things could be a, a picture, graphic. But think about what material you have that supports. Maybe it's a project you worked on or a, a portfolio of your work or just your resume. And there are two sections you can add it to. The first is in your summary section. And the second is right here under your first job that you list in the expertise section. So when you're in the edit mode on your profile, you won't be able to see this screen unless you're in the edit mode. You'll see this box at the bottom there. And you can either paste a URL into the white box, or you can hit the blue button and upload a file. Okay, And then that media, whatever you choose to add, will show up under your first job. So that's the only place you can put it besides your summary section. You can't add media for all your jobs, only for those two. Then we get to the skills and expertise section. And this is an important one, remember, because this is the keywords. These are searchable keywords that LinkedIn will use to pull you into search results. I don't want you to list too many because mostly because if you list 150 skills, no one believes you're good at all of them, right? Some of you probably are good at 150 things. I'm certainly not. So I want you to list, you know, 25, 30 that you're really good at. The other reason you don't want 150 is because if somebody pulls you up for a skill you're not really good at and they're looking for that kind of a skill in a LinkedIn search, your profile's not going to be that interesting to them anyway. Right? You want to show up in searches that you're really qualified for. So I want you to list, I don't know, 20, 25 skills and expertise. 
And I want you to be specific. Okay, this is not everything you've ever had any experience in. These are the things that you consider your best skills. The next section is your expert or your education. I list only the relevant information, right? No one cares where I went to preschool necessarily, so I don't put it on there. That's my college and my high school. If you feel like you want to go one step further back or you have special training in a certain field, by all means list that. And then this is a section people ignore, but I think it's a good one to fill out because it's your volunteer experience and the causes that you care about. And you remember a few slides ago, we talked about the no like and trust factor. We talked about that social media is a place where people get to know the real you, that it's authentic and unbiased. And I think this is a really powerful place to build that connection with the people looking at your profile. Because if you list the things you truly care about, maybe they care about those things too and it provides that common ground. This is a place you can show off your volunteer work a little bit, or at least the organizations that you support. So it's nice to give people a chance to get to know you as a human, as well as a professional. And then the additional information section. You can fill this one out or not. I've chosen to share my birthday and the fact that I'm married, although you'll see the year is conspicuously missing. <laughs> and I've chosen to share some of my interests there. Those are my real interests. I didn't do that for any reason other than those are the things I like, right? And maybe somebody looking at my profile likes those things too, and we would have something in common. If you don't want to list your birthday, marital status, and your interests, you do not have to fill this section out. So after you set up your profile, there are two things that you need to do ongoing. And the first is worry about this endorsement section. So you'll see there that the words on the left hand side of your screen are my skills and expertise. Those are the things I've listed as the things I'm good at on my profile. And to the right, those people, all those little faces you see, are people that have clicked a button saying, yes, Katie is good at those things. Okay? So this is where they endorse me. It's an easy thing to do. When it happens, I get this notification in the blue box here. It says Mike has endorsed me for social networking. And then I click the yellow add to my profile button and Mike's face goes over there on the left next to social networking. Okay? It's an easy thing to do, but I think this is important. First, for that social proof we talked about. Think about pulling up my profile and having lots of faces and pulling up someone's profile with no faces. Who has more skill? Right. You all know it's me by now, right? <laughs> so. The person with more faces automatically has credibility. It's just human nature, it's a psychological thing we do, but it helps. The second reason is, when people endorse you, it allows them to engage with your profile, right? If you are endorsing people and then they're endorsing you, people are regularly looking at your profile and engaging with the content there, and that's important. You want them to not just connect with you and ignore you, you want them to constantly be reminded that you're really smart and capable and have all these skills and expertise. And then lastly, it's good for search results. So LinkedIn pulls first on keywords, and then if people have the same keywords, they will put the order of search results based on who has the most endorsements. Okay? So my top one there is social media marketing. So I have, you'll see in the blue box to the left of that word, I have 99 plus endorsements. So let's say I have 100 endorsements there. So if I have 100 and somebody else has social media marketing, but they have 98, then I will show up above them in a search result. Okay? So even though we list the same keywords, the endorsements matter. So this is the first thing that you want to continue to do to your profile. And there is no way to request these. You can't make this happen other than endorsing other people. And so when you endorse other people, this happens if I go to Mike's profile, I get a blue box at the top saying, does Mike have these skills and expertise? And I can endorse him for all of those things. And what will happen is if I endorse Mike, then Mike gets a notification for me next time saying, hey, Katie endorsed you, you should endorse her back. Now I will tell you that just because all of those things came up in that box does not mean that I will endorse Mike for all of those things. Because I don't actually know if Mike has skills in all those areas. And I think that if my face is going to show up on his profile as somebody who endorsed him, then 
that says something, right? That's vouching for him in a way. And so I don't randomly endorse people. I only endorse people that I know and that I know they're good at those skills. So uh, Mike is my bookkeeper, so I might X out all the rest of those and just endorse him for bookkeeping, okay? So I want this to be authentic. I'm not just doing it to build my own profile. I'm doing it about people I really know and care about and, and think are skilled. And then the next level is your recommendations. Because after you do these endorsements, the other way to get feedback from people on your profile is to get recommendations, right? This is a little bit harder because people actually have to write recommendations. It's not just clicking a button. They actually have to write something for you. And it has to come through their LinkedIn profile. So there is no way to fake this. So you'll see Lori there um, wrote something about me. And then look where the red arrow is. Lori was my client. Okay. And this came through her LinkedIn profile onto my LinkedIn profile. So she wrote it on her profile and sent it to mine. And you can request these. There's a button in the black bar at the top of your LinkedIn profile that asks you to get recommendations and you can request them from people. And so I request them from my clients. You could request them from your professors or from colleagues or people you've interned for, right? And you'll see at the red circle at the top that I have 26 recommendations on my profile. That's across all of my jobs. So I think that you should aim for three to four for each position. Now, this involves people writing something about you and it's time consuming. So to get three to four, you probably have to ask for eight to 10, right? Because not everybody has time to do it and they won't do it in a timely manner. So you'll ask for eight to 10 and maybe get three to four out of it. And then if you look below the red arrow, you'll see Nancy has endorsed me and look below her endorsement uh, her recommendation there. She's also my client. That does not mean that all of my recommendations come from clients. You want to ask people who know you in a lot of different capacities. Maybe it's somebody you've worked with, maybe somebody you've worked for, maybe somebody who knows you um, during school, but you want to get what's called a 360 degree view. So the more people that know you in different capacities to write recommendations, the more authentic that is. And when employers are looking at it, it's uh, the most persuasive that way. Okay, so this is the slide to talk about who we connect with on LinkedIn. Because after we set up the profile and it looks good, then you're gonna get recommendations and endorsements and keep that going. And then you have to worry about who to connect with. And a lot of people subscribe to the, I'm gonna connect with anyone and everyone I can philosophy. And I'm gonna lay it out for you. There are two schools of thought here. And you can decide which one you're in. I will try not to make it really obvious which one I believe. So there are two schools of thought. And the first is called a lion. It has a catchy name, the other one doesn't. So just write this one down. So this one has a catchy name, it's called a lion. And lion means a LinkedIn open networker, okay? And if you are a lion, and people will write it on their profile occasionally, they'll say, I'm a lion. If you are a lion, you will connect with anyone who sends you a connection request because you believe that the more people you're connected to, the better, the bigger your network is, right? And so those people are trying to establish a broad network, right? The most people possible, but they don't necessarily know those people very well. So it's not so deep, more broad, right? So that's, that's lions. The second school of thought doesn't have a catchy name, but it is that you only connect with people you know, right? And you get to know them and build relationships. So you're gonna have a much uh, less broad pool there, right? But you're gonna have deeper relationships with those. So you have fewer people in your network, but they're people that you really, really know. So I said I wouldn't, but I, I'm in that one, okay? <laughs> and the reason is because we're gonna talk about what you do with that network next. And a lot of the things that I'm gonna tell you about don't work very well if you don't actually know the people you're connected to on LinkedIn, okay? So I will only connect with people that I actually know. And if somebody sends me a connection request and they don't know me personally, but I think, oh, that would be a good person to know, I write back to them and say, hey, I don't think we've met, but I would love to schedule a phone conversation or a coffee date and get to know you. And if they don't write back, problem solved, right? If they do write back, I've had a lot of fascinating phone conversations and coffee dates from that. And then I connect with them, 
right? So it doesn't mean you can't get to know someone new on LinkedIn, but until I have that conversation with them, I won't connect with them on my profile. And you'll start to see why in a few minutes. We can talk about it more at the end. So once you connect with people, they're gonna be either first, second, or third tier connections, okay? So you know that because the red circle to the right of the screen here says Dale is my second connection. Okay, and that's where you'll not be notified about first, second, or third tier connections. And I need you to understand what this means. So Dale and I don't actually know each other. We are not connected on LinkedIn. He is a second connection. If Dale and I were connected on LinkedIn, he would be a first tier connection. Okay, so everyone you are currently connected to is a first tier connection. Dale is second because he and I know someone in common. So everybody who knows someone that you know is your second tier connection. Does that make sense? And a third tier connection is somebody who you don't know anyone in common with. Okay? So it's important to understand how that network works. We're gonna focus mostly on second tier connections today because first tier connections you're already connected to. Under my theory, those would be people you knew right? And you had some kind of relationship with, they're connected to you on LinkedIn. The second tier are all the people that know those people. Okay, this will make more sense in just a second. So as you're connecting with people, I need you to go through and tag them. This is a customer relationship management system that's inside LinkedIn that a lot of people don't utilize, but it's one of the most useful features. So this is a list of all my contacts. All I've done is pull my connections up from the black bar at the top, and it gives me a list of everybody I'm connected to. And then you see at the red arrow that there's a button on each one of them that says tag. And if I click that tag button, I can go through and put these people into categories. Okay, so Gemma here, I'm gonna put into one of those categories. And LinkedIn gives you default categories, but I've also created those. So you'll see the blue a uh, line at the very bottom of the screen, it says add new tags. You can add tags to be whatever you want. But this is basically like buckets that you're putting all your connections in so it becomes easier to communicate with them in a meaningful way. So I put all my clients in a bucket and all my prospects in a bucket and all my coworkers in a bucket. And I put everybody in California in a bucket, right? People can be in multiple buckets, but you're gonna make tags for all these people. And here's the important part, they don't see the tags. Okay, you can call them whatever you wanna call them within reason, but they're not gonna know what tags they're in. So Gemma is a friend, so maybe I would just click the friend category there, right? And I would put her in that bucket. And this is important because we're gonna use these buckets differently moving forward. So think about what ways to categorize all those connections are meaningful to you, okay? You can call them anything you want and put them in any buckets you want. But as we push out content, we're going to send them to certain buckets. And most people say, oh, push out content. This is LinkedIn. I don't have to put content on LinkedIn. But you do. Because once you set up your profile and everything is all set there, then you need to actively use that profile. You've got to work it a little bit, right? Because having it just be the online resume only gets you so far. So just like you do on Facebook and Twitter and some of these other social media channels, I want you to put content on your LinkedIn profile. You do not have to do it as often as you do it on Facebook and Twitter. Three times a week would be plenty, but you are gonna push out content, mostly related to your professional goals or industry, right? This is not the place where you're gonna put pictures of your lunch or vacation snapshots, right? This is the most professional social media channel you can put pictures of your lunch on Facebook all day long. We won't talk about that. But on LinkedIn, you're gonna put only professional content. So articles about your industry, blog posts you've written, stats or information that relates to your professional goals. And there are three places you're gonna put them. The first is on your individual profile as updates. And we're gonna go through each of these individually in a second. The second is in groups. You can participate in groups and share information there. And the third is direct messages to your connections, okay? And one of the reasons we put them in buckets 
is because you don't want to send content to people that don't care about that content because that's spam. So if I'm sending it directly to somebody, one of the reasons I have a California bucket is if I speak somewhere and I want people to go see it, I send the notification for that just to the California bucket because people in Georgia can't come see it. Make sense? So the first one is sharing in your own newsfeed. So when you log on to LinkedIn, this is the home screen that you will see. Before you even go to your profile, you'll see this home screen. And you'll see that there's a box up there at the top, a white box that looks just like the share box on Facebook. It works exactly the same way. You write what you want to write and you can paste a link in there. And when you hit share in that box, it goes in the news feed, the LinkedIn news feed of everyone who's connected to you. Meaning when they log on to their homepage, they will see your updates there. And they can interact with the updates. They have like, share, and comment buttons, just like Facebook does. Okay? So the first place you're going to put content is out in this news feed. The second place you're going to put content is in groups. So groups is just a drop down from that black bar at the top of the screen, or the top of your profile. And it looks like this, they're discussion forums. So you'll see the guy there, Paul, he has submitted an article into this group called the Small Business Guide to Google Analytics. And then at the top, there's a button for me to submit something. This is a small business group. When you look for groups to join on LinkedIn, you're gonna look for places that you can share your expertise, right? Industry groups or related organizations to where you want to work or be a part of. Sometimes companies will have their own groups and you can get into those. So I would share information there at the top of the screen and maybe I wrote a blog post or I found an article that I thought would be valuable for the members of this group and I would paste it into that box. And it goes out to all the members of that group. So those are two places. And then the third is to send it directly to one of my buckets of connections. So this is just the list of my connections again. I brought it up. And you'll see the circle at the top of that screen. It says filter by, and this is all my contacts, but I can filter it by any of those tags that I've created. So I can filter it by clients or California or friends or office mates, whatever it is, whatever buckets I've created. I can filter this list and then those people come up. And then where the red arrow is there, there's a message button. And I can use that button to send messages to each of the people in that, that tag. And it goes, it's a group message, right? You don't have to do it individually. It goes to all of them at once. And it will go to them into their inbox in LinkedIn, their LinkedIn inbox, and then they will get an email notification. Okay? So if I found an article that really would help a certain group that I'm connecting with or would be useful to somebody, I will send it directly to those people through LinkedIn. And this is nice because you're sending them valuable content, but it's also a way of keeping yourself top of mind, right? The reason you're putting content out on your LinkedIn profile is to stay top of mind with all the people you're connected to, right? Because how many of you could list all the people that you're connected to right now? Not many of us, right? We don't remember who we connected to. Sometimes it's hundreds of people. If you're a lion, it could be thousands of people, right? So you're not going to remember all of those people, and this keeps you visible in their stream. Whether they're getting content from you, seeing you in the news feed, running into you in groups. It can also expose your content, especially in groups, to people that don't know you yet. Right? Everybody who's in a group with you on LinkedIn is not necessarily connected to you on LinkedIn. So if they see you constantly putting out good industry information in a group, that can do a lot to build your expertise and your credibility with them and maybe they'll reach out to you for a connection after that. So this part is customer relationship management. Could also be prospect relationship management. You don't have to have customers for this to work. But this is basically where we're going to track our relationships with people that we're connected to. Okay? Because presumably the reason you're connecting with people on LinkedIn is to maintain that relationship and hopefully turn it into a business relationship down the road, whether they're going to hire you or provide some kind of business relationship. So the first thing we're going to do is organize the connections into lists. We did that, right? We put them in the buckets. Then you're going to track your interactions with these people and reach out strategically. 
So I will tell you that every Friday morning, I spend two hours on my LinkedIn. This is the only day of the week I do this. You don't have to spend two hours every day. Friday morning, I spend two hours and I bring up one of my tags and I reach out to all the people in that bucket. Whether I'm sending them an article or just writing to say hi or commenting on something they've posted, but it helps me interact with those people strategically on a regular basis. I'm staying top of mind with them. So usually I would pick a bucket like clients or prospects, right, to interact with. Let's look what that looks like. So we've tagged our connections. This is the same screenshot we saw before when you, we tagged Gemma. And once you've given everybody a category, you can sort the categories by that filter all button at the top. And then once you've done it, if you look at somebody's individual profile, their relationship with you is spelled out there. This is Brian, he's a, a client of mine. And you have to read from the bottom of the screen up to understand what we're looking at here. So this relationship button will exist on all your connections. No one sees it but you. Okay, so anything I write in here is only visible to me. Brian doesn't see it and neither does anyone else looking at either of our profiles. So at the bottom of the screen, it says, how did you meet? And I filled in that Brian and I met in Encore offices, that's the office building I work in, in March of 2012. And then the next step up, LinkedIn marked that on March 29th, we connected on LinkedIn. So it shows you when you connected. Then one step up from that, it says, do you want to write any notes about Brian? And I did. I wrote that Brian became a client of mine on October of 2013. Okay. So you can make that note section anything you want. You can say, I applied for a job with this person, or I sent my resume, or I reached out for an informational interview. It can be any kind of note you want. And then the next section up says, do you want to set any reminders about Brian? And in my case, I said, yes, I want to check on Brian's start date, and I'm going to send that reminder on November 17th. And on November 17th, LinkedIn sent me an email without me doing anything else. It sent me an email that said, remember to check on Brian's start date. And it gave me a link to his profile. It's super useful. So if you sent resumes to people and you put that all in your notes, you could set reminders two weeks later to follow up on the resumes you sent or to send thank you notes after an interview or to schedule an additional meeting, right? You can use this for all kinds of things, but Nobody sees it but you, and it will automatically manage this. It will automatically send you those reminders. So this is a useful way for me to track the relationship I have with Brian and anyone else. And then the other thing it does, this is Jeff. If you've written an email with somebody in the past six months, this is kind of scary, it pulls your email into your LinkedIn profile. So this is Jeff. He and I have been emailing a lot lately, and you'll see that all of those emails from my Gmail account have been pulled into Jeff's LinkedIn profile. So when I look at him and click that relationship tab, I can see all of our emails right there. So it's incredibly powerful to connect with people here because I'm reviewing our emails and I'm reminded of who he is. I can see his picture and his title and all his contact information. I have all of that right there at the tip of my fingers. And again, nobody sees these emails but me Jeff doesn't probably even know they're there, but LinkedIn will show me. And people always ask if I connected my email to my LinkedIn profile to make this happen. I did not. It just knows. It's the power of social media. The email I use to log into my LinkedIn account is my business email, so it's pulling from there. Okay? but it knows who I've been emailing and it puts them into their profile. And this will happen even if you are not connected to someone. You'll see in the upper right hand corner of this screenshot that Jeff is my third connection, which means he and I are not connected on LinkedIn and it still knows that we've been emailing. So this customer tracking stuff and relationship tracking is pretty powerful. Let's see how we use that and work our network to get referrals. So the first thing you're gonna do is connect with people in your industry. Maybe they're people that you've met on the job or that you would like to meet, right? You connect with people. And then you can go through their connections and ask for introductions. Okay, so all of their connections are visible to you. 
And what we're going to do is look for people who know somebody that we know, right? This is why it's important to know your connections. So this is John. John's a client of mine. And you'll see that I'm just looking at his LinkedIn profile there. And on the right hand side of the screen, in that red circle, I can see John's 500 connections. This is visible for anybody you look up on LinkedIn. And when I click on that button, it shows me what's down on the lower right hand side of the screen here, all of John's connections. And this list goes on and on. This is just all that would fit on my slide. So John's connections come up and I can scroll through and say, who would I like to meet? And you'll see that I see their names and their job titles and all of this stuff. So I picked somebody in the far right column, right in the middle, Maurice. So Maurice there with the gray suit and the green background, he is the one I would like to meet. He's a lawyer, I think I could help him. John knows him. I would like John to introduce me to that person. So I click on Maurice. And when I'm looking at Maurice's profile, where the red arrow is there, there's a little upside down triangle. And this will exist on any profile you look at. If you click that upside down triangle, you'll get a get introduced button. It's highlighted there in blue. And if I click the get, inter get introduced button, it gives me this screen. Katie is on the left, Maurice is on the right. Now in the middle, who can introduce us? And it will show me anyone that I know in common with Maurice. So I know two Johns. They both know me and they know Maurice. So at this point, I would pick which one of those people I knew the best. Which one of those people knows me the best and can vouch for me with Maurice? And that would be the top one, John Burns. And so I would click John Burns and he would go in the center there where the question mark is. And then it will open up an email. And in the email, it will say, Dear John, <laughs> ironically, that's what it says, Dear John. And I will write this email to John Burns asking him to introduce me to Maurice. Now, the really important part is Maurice will see this email. Okay, this is public. So be careful about how you word the email because Maurice is going to see it. But I say, John, I noticed you know Maurice. I think I could really help Maurice with his social media. Could you introduce us? And John then gets the email. And if he agrees that he'll introduce us, he clicks, yes, I'll introduce them. And then he writes an email to Maurice. Maurice, Katie's great. I think you'd like her. You two should connect. And Maurice will get the email with my original email and John's email. And then if Maurice says yes, he clicks the yes button and I will get all the emails back saying, now we're going to meet. Okay, it looks like this. This is not Maurice, but this is another example. You have to read from the bottom. This is Adam, a financial planner. And Adam says, hi, Sean, an introduction to Katie would be great. Our office is looking for more LinkedIn expertise and I'm interested in what Katie has to say on the matter. And he sent that email to Sean, who's in the middle there. He's a wellness guy. And he, Sean says, Katie and Steven, good morning. That's my husband, Steven. Katie and Steven, good morning. I have a referral for you. Adam is a broker I'm connected to. If you could reach out to him, that would be great. And so I get both those emails. And then at the top of the screen, this is what I write after receiving those. Hi, Adam, nice to meet you. I would love to chat about your company's LinkedIn needs. I know what he wants, right? Because I can read his email at the bottom. I'm getting both of these. And I said, you can email me directly. And then Adam and I connect. Now, the reason this is powerful is because if Adam tried to connect with me, I don't know who he is, maybe I wouldn't connect with him, right? But if Sean's asking me to meet Adam, and I know Sean, I'm friends with Sean, there's a little bit of social pressure, right? It's very hard for me to say, nah, I don't want to meet Adam, because Adam's going to see this email. So there's a little bit of social pressure to take the introduction. And so it can be a very powerful way to get introduced to people that you would like to meet through people that you know. Now, if I didn't actually know Sean, is it the same kind of social pressure? No, right? So this is why it's important that you, shameless plug, that you know all your connections, right? So if you were a lion and didn't know who Sean was, then his recommendation to meet Adam isn't gonna hold much weight with you. But since I do know him, I'll meet who he says I should meet. Okay, so this type of leverage works a lot better when you know the people in your network. This type of activity, leveraging your second connections, can also be used for prospecting. 
Maybe you have a company you know you want to work for and you just need to meet somebody inside that company. But you don't know who you know that might know somebody in the company. So this is how we would find out. We'd search for prospects and then find those second tier connections. I'm going to show you screenshots in a second. You would find the second tier connections, the people that know somebody you know, and then ask them to introduce you. So the first thing we're going to do is use the advanced search button on LinkedIn. It's in the black bar at the top of your screen. That black bar is at the top of your profile always. And you'll see the button to the right of the search box that says advanced. If I hit that advanced button, then the gray screen that we're seeing on the lower right hand corner here comes up. This is the advanced search box and I can fill it out. So you have a couple of choices. Look at the red arrow at the top left. This is where you put keywords. And I filled it out to say marketing because I like to connect with marketing people. So if you have an industry term that you'd like to connect with people in that industry, you could put it there. I don't have to fill out the keywords though. What if I left that blank and see a little farther down, it says company. I could fill out just the company name. If there was a company I wanted to connect with or a school, if I wanted to connect with somebody at a certain school, right? You could fill out any of those words. So I'm searching by keyword, but you could search by a specific company or a specific school. And then that may be all you need to fill out, but I'm an in-person person. I like to meet people. And so I filled out where the second red arrow is down there at the bottom, where it is my zip code. So that's the zip code of my office. And I said, show me everyone within 25 miles of my office who says they're into marketing. Okay? And remember, if I put that keyword, where is LinkedIn pulling that from? Those are people that use the word marketing either in their headline or listed it as their skills and expertise. Okay? So again, you either pick a company or you pick a keyword. You can fill out the zip code if you want to or you don't have to. But the important part is in the red circle in the middle there. I'm clicking only show me the second connections that fit this criteria, which means those people know somebody that I know. Because if they're first connections, I already know them. This is a fruitless search, right? And if they're third connections, third tier connections, I don't know anybody who they know, so I can't ask anybody to introduce me. But the second connections, I can leverage. So I'm saying, show me only the second connections that are in marketing within 25 miles of my zip code. And this screen will come up. It's a big long list. This is just all that would fit on my screenshot. So I look through here and I decide who I would like to meet. If you're searching by company, this would probably be a little smaller than a keyword search, right? But I find Melissa here, the second one down, and I say, okay, I would like to meet Melissa. And then you see that the green button says two shared connections. And when I click that, I get the results by the red arrow, which is Melissa and I know MJ and Sophia in common. So now I'm going to pick which one of those ladies, MJ or Sophia, I know the best. Which one could introduce me? And you'll see the red circle to the right of the screen. It's that same upside down triangle that we saw on Maurice's profile, remember? If I hit that button, that will give me the Get Introduced screen. And we will go through the exact same process where there's a question mark in the middle and I'm on one side and Melissa's on the other and I pick MJ to introduce me and then we send emails back and forth. So if you had done it with a company and this was three people who worked in a company and all of them knew somebody that you knew, then you could ask somebody inside that company to introduce you. I told you we'd talk about the industry news part, so we'll mention it really fast. This is the news magazine inside LinkedIn. It's called Pulse. To the left of your screen is the black bar at the top of your profile, and it's just a drop down. It's right under groups, but you click on Pulse, and Pulse will pull up a news magazine with articles that matter to you. How do you know they matter to you? Because you're going to tell it what you're interested in. See the red arrow? There's a button that says Discover, and when you hit the Discover button, first it's going to pull up a list of topics. And again, this goes down, there are probably 45 of them. It goes a long way. So you're going to pull up this list of topics. And then where the red arrow is, there's a little plus in every corner. And you're going to plus the ones you care about. So you'll see if you look on the bottom row there, 
second to the right or second to the, from the right, I have clicked entrepreneurship and small business because I care about that, right? In the upper right hand corner, I've clicked customer service because I care about that. So you click any topics you care about and then LinkedIn knows the industries you're into. And this has topics for every industry you could imagine. And then it's gonna show you news outlets. And it says, what news outlets do you like? And you'll see where the red arrow is. I clicked NPR, because I used to work there. But you can click any news outlets you like. And again, this is a large list. There's probably 50 of them. So you tell it what papers or newspapers or uh, radio or TV you watch on a regular basis. And then it will say, what influencers do you like? So these are famous people, newsmakers. I don't know why they're all men in this screenshot. There are lots of women in there too. But you would click the ones you care about. So you'll see that I've clicked Jeff Weiner, who's the CEO at LinkedIn. And there's a million of these, probably 300. So you can pick the newsmakers you care about. And based on that information, LinkedIn will customize that Pulse news magazine for you every day. So here's the secret. I use the Pulse LinkedIn news magazine to get content to share on my LinkedIn profile, right? Because you need to be sharing content that shows you're up to date on your field. This is information that's up to date on your field. I take the articles, I share them on my profile. And that's not duplication because nobody else has customized their pulse exactly like I have. So even if we're in the same industry, they may not be seeing the same articles. So I'm gonna share the articles with them. So how long is all this gonna take? Right? There's a lot to do on your LinkedIn profile once you set it up, but I think you can do it really well in 15 minutes a day. Okay? So if you do 15 minute blocks, and I told you I spend two hours on my LinkedIn on Fridays, but every other day I only spend 15 minutes. So 15 minute blocks, the first five minutes, you're going to post new content. So you're going to grab articles from Pulse or maybe something you read somewhere else, and you're going to put it in groups and on your profile and maybe send it to people, right? The second five minutes, you're gonna to respond to comments. So maybe you've shared things that people have commented on or hit the like button and you're gonna interact with them, right? And then the third five minutes, you're gonna interact with other people's content. So this is a way for you to stay top of mind. Either you're gonna pull up one of your buckets, one of your tags and interact with those people's content or you're just gonna go through your news feed and interact. If you use your LinkedIn regularly, you know that sometimes they send you notifications if it's someone's birthday or they're having work anniversaries. Those are great places to interact, right? Spend five minutes commenting on that stuff or saying congratulations or happy birthday. It just keeps you top of mind. It keeps that relationship strong with people in your network. And then the last, you have to go back to work, right? Or, or do your school stuff. Because LinkedIn is helpful, but you, you have to also have a job. So, this is how I do it. If you get really ambitious, you could start with 15 minutes twice a day, but it's really not necessary. If you spent 15 minutes on your profile once a day, you would have a very active and thriving LinkedIn. And you focus on maintaining those relationships. But there's a catch, because there's a once a week thing too. And this is my two hours on Friday. What I do is keep all of the business cards I've gotten through the week, and on Fridays, I will connect with those people on LinkedIn. And the reason I wait is because I like there to be a little bit of a lag time between when I met them and when I connect with them because it gives me another way to touch them, right? Let's say I had a business meeting with somebody on Tuesday or an interview, then I follow up with them on Friday and connect on LinkedIn. It's just reminding them. Hopefully they've gotten my thank you note in the meantime, right? And I'm just touching them again. And then once a week I go through and all my new connections, I put them into those buckets. I put them in the tags and categorize them. And then I do the searching for prospects and the asking for referrals that we did, the working the second connections, okay? And I do this for a living, so I spend about two hours. You could probably spend 45 minutes and be just fine. But once a week, you're gonna put a little more than your 15 minutes into it and you're gonna work these connections. If you remember nothing else, these are the five rules to doing a good job on your LinkedIn. Okay, we've covered a lot of stuff today, but these are the five things you need to remember. One, complete your profile, get to that 100%, fill that fishbowl, right, so that you're in high search results. Two, think about the keywords and phrases you're going to use on your profile. 
You use them in two places, on your headline or title and in the skills and expertise section. Three, share your profile offline, right? Once this is filled out and it looks really good, this is a big credibility tool for you. So you want people to find it. Put it on your resume, put it in your email signature, drive traffic there. Four, engage with others. Just putting stuff out on your own profile only gets you halfway. At the end of the day, LinkedIn is a social network, just like Facebook or Twitter or Google+. And so you have to actually have conversation and interaction there for it to be useful. And then five, this is the rule of all social media. You are not going to be over promotional or try to sell anything, right? Even yourself, right? You want to talk about your skills and expertise, but not in a way where you're cramming it down someone's throat. Because social media, remember there's 906 million hours a month, most of those hours are leisure time. And if people have to deal with you selling yourself all the time while they're trying to enjoy their social media, then it turns them off and they'll tune out pretty quickly. So no overly promotional. I always say that you don't want to say anything on LinkedIn or any other social network that you wouldn't say at a networking event or a cocktail party. If you met somebody face to face, you would not start with a list of all your attributes. Right? So you don't lead with that here either. You only make human conversation. It's just typed instead of spoken. All right. That covers it for today. Um, and I guess we have time for questions if you're ready. Great. This is some places you can get in touch with me and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards as well. Great, Katie, thank you so much. I'll start with some questions from the, uh, from the virtual audience and I'll give the in-person crowd a chance to gather their thoughts. Great. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Um, first one, and there are a couple of kind of around this similar topic. Uh, the delicate situation when you might be asked for a recommendation or endorsement from someone whose skills you don't particularly recommend or endorse, right. but you do really value the relationship. Perhaps they're a coworker or uh, it's, a, it's a relationship you value. What, what's your advice in that scenario? So. You have three choices in that scenario, right? And, and you'll have to sort of tailor it to exactly who this person is and how important they are in your life. The first, which is the one most people use, is you ignore the request, mm -hmm. right? You just don't respond to it. And then they have probably asked multiple people to do it at the same time, especially if it's an endorsement. And so they may forget that they asked you and the situation will blow over. Number two, you, okay, so that's the cop out, but it, it could work. <laughs> Number two, you write something but soft pedal it a little bit, right? You can say, I really enjoy my relationship with this person on these levels without saying they're good at X, right? So you write something that you don't necessarily um, outwardly endorse them, but it still maintains that relationship. And people who get recommendations from you on mm. LinkedIn will choose whether to display them on their profile or not. So if you write something that's innocuous enough, they may choose not to even display it, right? But then you've still obliged. Or number three, is that you have the hard conversation and say, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I don't think you're good at your job. I would say I don't feel like I know enough about your skills or your services to write this at this point. Um, but maybe we could have coffee and I'd love to hit, learn more and maybe down the road I'm happy to do it. Okay, great. Uh, this is a two part question I like a lot. What are, what are one or two of the most common mistakes you see professionals make on LinkedIn? And then also, what are one or two or the, of the most critical or da potentially damaging mistakes you see? Okay, so the two common ones are sort of diametrically opposed. Number one is they either don't fill out their profile, they just put their name and maybe don't even have a picture and just a couple of lines, and then they expect us all to wanna to connect with them. So if you don't tell anybody anything about yourself, there's no basis for them to form that know, like, and trust with you. Um, but then the other mistake is some people go a little overboard and it's so salesy and promotional and they've got you know, 15 things and that title up at the top and their summary is 45 paragraphs long and, and they're just trying so hard to sell themselves that people don't even get through those profiles. They glance at them and they go, uh, not so much, and they'll move on. And so I would say, you said the critical things that we need to make sure you're doing. I would say the number one critical thing that people forget is that you do have to use the profile. You can't just set it up and leave it there. It's a social network, people expect that engagement and you won't get very good results if you just treat it like a resume. Instead, you've got to be putting out content, having conversations, interacting with people. Great. Uh, we have a, a big uh, school of psychology here, so a lot of our uh, attendees today uh, work in that field. 
And they're wondering your thoughts uh, regarding the ethical issues in those situations about asking uh, therapists or counselors asking clients for endorsements or recommendations. That gets a little bit dicey on LinkedIn because on a LinkedIn profile, the recommendation will come from a specific person's profile. There's no way to say KDW, right? They're going to know exactly who it is and it's probably going to have a picture. So I think that's a conversation that you, you have to have with the person, whether they're comfortable with that or not. But in a lot of cases, that's not going to be possible. And you're going to have to go with people that maybe are referral partners and know your work to refer people to you or are coworkers, that sort of thing other types of that 360 view and not so much clients or, or I've seen it work with past clients like people that have been treated by you years ago and are now comfortable saying it um, Katie I just wanted to thank you so much for your presentation you. I learned a lot and I realized that I'm using my LinkedIn completely wrong uh -oh. so I have a lot of homework to do this weekend um, but I wanted to ask about um, you talked about the endorsements and if you're in a position where maybe you do have a lot of endorsements but it's not a field that you're wanting to continue in um, is there a way to remove them or how do you manage that part yeah so you can hide your endorsements and also when people send you endorsements you choose whether to accept them or not so somebody once endorsed me for newspapers, which is great, but I've never worked for a newspaper in my life. So I didn't choose to display that on my profile. Um, so yeah, you can go through and edit that section and, and take off the ones you don't want to display. And I, I would. I have two questions. Uh, one is me personally, I see a lot of uh, sales, marketing, uh, bankers, that type of professions, titles in LinkedIn. Um, have you seen an increase in therapists, uh, professors, psychologists, you know, physical therapists, sort of the social science. And then my second question is, if you're a manager of, let's say, five to ten, um, and, and, the, and it requires a lot of networking, and let's say many of them don't have a LinkedIn, how would you approach getting them to create one? And would you, make, would you enforce it as a sort of a policy as a manager, or would you just lightly hint at it? Okay, so the first question, um, is yes, LinkedIn is, is a quickly growing platform. And even though it, it started to be more popular, you're right, with people like mortgage brokers and realtors and that sort of thing, it has expanded across all different industries and fields. And these days, some of the more blue collar things, I work with a lot of landscape contractors and stuff, don't always use LinkedIn, but in the social sciences they do. And I think it's, you're seeing it expand. Because it works so well with the Google um, algorithm, and it's so easy to show up online that way, people do want to have that, that piece of, of expertise out there, you know? So yeah, I think it's growing in those areas. And I think the more people that sort of start to use it well, the more people want to get on board. Um, and then as a manager, so I'm a little biased because I think everybody should have a LinkedIn, right? But I think if you were going to require it of your um, subordinates, I would provide training for them. Hold a, a workshop or something where they can understand how to fill it out and how to use it properly. Because I think the thing that holds a lot of people back is that they get intimidated by it. They don't know what it's supposed to do or if they're doing it right and that can be embarrassing. And so they're hesitant to go into it. Um, whereas if you provide that training, I think they'll feel a lot more confident. And I also think that if you are in charge of a business and then you have people that work for that business, I think it's a nice thing to standardize the way people talk about the business on LinkedIn. So write a paragraph that they can all use for when they list that job, you know, and sort of take that guesswork out of it and you're, you're creating your, your company standards too. Thank you very much, Katie, for the lovely presentation. I too have a lot of homework to do this weekend. <laughs> One question for you. I did notice that on some of the profiles, there is the box, the LinkedIn premium, the IN gold. Can you please touch up on that and how those features would help us or is it necessary or are you a big fan of those? Um, so I'm not a big fan of the LinkedIn premium. Don't tell Reed Hoffman. Um, I don't have a paid subscription myself. <laughs> And I have never recommended to any of my clients that they get one. The only people those are really valuable for are people that are like headhunters or recruiters, um, people whose job it is to meet people they don't know. Because um, basically what the premium will do, the biggest difference is it will allow you to reach out to people that you don't have anyone in connect connected to. So like those third tier connections who you don't know anyone in common with. All the things we talked about today you can do with the free account. 
But the third tier connections, if you wanted to send emails to people you had no connection with, that's what it allows you to do. But that's a hard sell because it's a cold call, right? At some point, it might be better just to send them an email and a link to your profile so they could check you out without the pressure, right? So I'm not a big fan of the, it's expensive and I'm not a big fan of needing that um, unless you're going into headhunting. Hi, Katie, I have a, a question in regards to the lion and the not so lion yeah. type lion. of people. Yeah. Um, it, do you think you could use the tags that you were showing us to kind of find a happy meeting where you expand your network but tag the not so well-known uh, connections so you can still get that broad network but still deepen your pool as well and then my yeah. second question is on the picture um, mm -hmm. could you use not your profile and like for example on mine because of this going on here um, <laughs> I have uh, like a keyboard, but it's my um, my name plaque on on my desk uh, instead of my picture, my actual face. <laughs> okay. So, are, no, what are your are thoughts questions. on that picture? A lot of people do that. Okay. So let's talk about the first part first. I think that's actually a really good way to sort of straddle the line between lion and not so lion. Um, is, is by categorizing those people into a bucket where you know, look, I've never met these people, right? The only thing that that takes away is that if you wanted to meet somebody and those people are the only people that knew them, it's hard to ask for that recommendation, right? You don't have any leverage for that relationship. Um, and so I want you to just ask yourself why you care about being connected to them. You know, if it's just to keep in touch with people in your industry, then I would say you've got to work those relationships, right? I've certainly connected with people that have really high up jobs that I think could be great connections, but I don't know them, but then I take it upon myself to get to know them, right? I share content, I comment on their content, I have um, interactions, and then they get out of that bucket, right? They become people I do know. So I think it's fine to build relationships there, but if you're just connecting for the sake of connecting, you have to ask yourself why you're bothering, you know, because nobody really cares how many connections you have. It doesn't make you look any better, right? Once it gets to 500, they don't even list them. So. Ask yourself what, what the strategy is there. Um, and then for your picture, you're not gonna like it because of this going on, but <laughs> I, yes, I think that you, um, I think that you have to have a picture or it's, it's wise to have a picture because we're building that know, like, and trust factor, right? And if you're gonna get to know somebody, they deserve to know what you look like. They're gonna meet you in person anyway. And I think that sometimes when I see somebody who uses a logo or another snapshot that's not their face, I think, why are they doing that? Like it seems a little inauthentic, right? And I, I actually, I'm a stickler for these things, but I, I won't connect with those people because if they don't really want me to get to know them, then I don't have any interest in connecting. So I think at some point you could use an older picture. It doesn't have to be you today if, if that's not good, but I think it's awesome anyway. So you'd be fine. <laughs> Uh, we had a question come in from a 50-year-old attendee, and that will be relevant here in a second. Okay. Uh, she's engaged in a job search, and she's uh, not generating, and she's re relying on LinkedIn heavily, and she's not generating uh, as much interest or response as as she uh, as she would like. And she fears that potential employers aren't responding because of her age, and uh, she's wondering if if and can she remove information that would identify her by age, she doesn't want to uh, be deceptive or anything, but at the same time, she'd rather be able to address the topic after these people have had a chance to sure. get to know some of her qualifications and skills. What, what, what's your advice there? Sure, so I think that's a realistic concern. You know, we do check each other out and we make snap uh, judgments. You can remove um, the qualifying information, so you can remove your birthday or college day or whatever. You only put down the dates you want to put down. Um, the part you can't get around is maybe a photo, right? If, if you were worried about somebody judging your age based on your appearance, um, that would be hard to get around. Um, but I, I think, yeah, take off the dates of your college and your birthday or whatever and get a great glamour shot and, and move forward. You know, at the end of the day, if your profile has enough experience and, and things that make you stand out, I don't think that age is going to be as big a deal. But you have to know how to tell that story in your profile and really portray the things you do have going for you. Uh, Katie, thanks again for being here today. Uh, 
pleasure to hear you speak about social media, LinkedIn, and um, I definitely have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, having said that, um, with the increase of, of social media uh, across all industries, um, the use of it, um, and specifically LinkedIn as we're talking about today, what would your advice be to somebody who is uh, working on their LinkedIn account, having it um, accessible, but their employer possibly um, is, is, or they're fearful that their employer may think that they're looking for another job specifically, rather than just maintaining a LinkedIn account um, for the professional connections as, as what you were discussing, that fear of, well, they're going to think I'm looking for another job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think one of the red flags um, about that is people who are constantly updating or tweaking their, their um, profiles because when you make changes to your profile, it will go out in the news feed. Right, so people will know that you've updated your skills and experience or updated this or whatever. So I think one of the red flags for employers is people that are constantly tweaking or trying to like change the way they're putting it out there. So I would suggest you do that all at once, like put out a two hour block or a three hour block on the weekend and just get it done. And then I think it's an open conversation. You know, I would say, hey, I've been working really hard on my LinkedIn profile and I, I'm doing it to network and I hope it helps, it, maybe even in, approach your employer and say, is there any way you'd like me to talk about this company on my profile? You know, that boilerplate thing that we talked about. Is there any language you like to use when I say where I work? Um, you know, at my office, I require my team to have LinkedIn profiles, right? And we, we do. We standardize what they say about Katie Wagner social media so that everybody works the same place and it, it looks the same. But I, you know, I would encourage them to use that because it's helpful to the business as a whole to have your employers or your employees be well networked. Um, but I think you have to let people know, like, this is why I'm doing it. And do you have any concerns? I think it's an open conversation. Hey, Katie, thank you. Hey. Uh, it's been informative and, and helpful. And for how much help was my question, uh, as, as um, endorsements come through, I really didn't understand what they were. So I'd just been ignoring them thinking, oh, I don't have time for this. Sure. And so is there a way to go in and like, back into the endorsements that have come through in, in the past few months? Yes, if you go into the edit part of your profile and you go to that endorsement section, it should give you a list of the endorsements you've gotten. It may time out at a certain point, but I'm not sure, but at least six months or so of, of those endorsements and you can add them to your profile. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Hi, Hi. I'm Jenny. Um, MBA student, I have a question about the dangers of social media. Is there any dangers like finding false um, profiles trying to connect with you and how do you like manage that? Yeah, well, I think the dangers of social media are the same dangers we sometimes face in other mediums as well. You know, we get spam email or people prank calling us or in person. Some people aren't that nice, right? Um, so yeah, that exists and I'll get a lot of spam on my LinkedIn, but I think that that's another point to don't just connect with anyone who sends you a request. I think that you have to look at their profile and decide, is this somebody who's being authentic who I want to have a relationship with? And then also, you know, I showed you the personal section on my profile. I don't include anything on there that I wouldn't tell anyone who asked, right? I'm not gonna put my home address down on my LinkedIn profile, right? or maybe my personal cell phone number, those things don't appear anywhere on there. So even though I put things like my birthday or my marital status, those are things that I would readily tell anybody. I wouldn't necessarily say what city I lived in or where, because you do have to be careful. Um, and you know, likewise for people who have business addresses that are their home addresses or you know, who don't have another address to put, just leave that part blank um, because you don't wanna give anybody too much access. It's not a good idea. Hi, Katie. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. It was really good. I've used LinkedIn quite a bit in the last so many years of my career um, and working with uh, a consulting firm where, you know, banging out and trying to get relationships and connect with people becomes, uh, you know, such an important thing. Um, just from a market standpoint, I mean, uh, I'm a mentor here at uh, Cal Southern and we have students and learners that are all over the country and all over the world as well. Have you noticed a difference in usage in various different business markets? When I was in the Bay Area living up there and working for this consulting firm, I mean, it was all about getting connected on LinkedIn immediately, immediately, everybody was a lion type of situation. Yeah. Um, and I've noticed down in Southern California, the market segment is slightly different from that perspective because we are removed from that 
tech side, you know, so much more than, you know, Irvine is building up and becoming that way. Right. But I feel that it's changed a lot. Have you noticed in different business market segments on the usage of LinkedIn and how effective it's been from a, you know, lion versus not standpoint? So, yes, I mean, I think they're definitely hot pockets of, of early adopters. San Francisco would be one of them. Um, Atlanta is hot for social media, Boston, the, the big urban areas, right? And so those are people who start to use the channels before places sometimes like Orange County. Um, so, yeah, but I think it is catching on and it's sort of growing. And again, as people see the value of it and what it really can do for you, more people are getting into it. Um, I also think that's true across industries. So certain industries, people were really early adopters and said, hey, I can use this to keep from doing cold calls or whatever, right? This could make my workload easier. Sales is really popular, headhunting, those type things. Um, but I think, and I, I don't know if this is really answering your question, but I think as people start to adopt it, there becomes a higher call for the authenticity factor and nobody wants to be bombarded with all that stuff anymore. They say, hey, I joined this so I can keep in touch with my business connections and the people I network with and I'm going to tune out to all the, the heavy lion, you know, recruiting activity. Right. Um, and so I think there, any social media evolves as it, as it grows, right? And I think there is a call now to really make genuine connections on LinkedIn and to use it in a way that helps us all and can really build our networks rather than just sales or pushing too hard. Does that help? A little bit. Got one kind of maybe follow-up to it. Yeah, great. That The effectivity of it within a market, either in the Bay Area or here in Southern California, maybe somewhere in the Midwest, um, do each of the markets, have you seen whether they change from a, you know, one being this way versus that way? I, I think only in the fact that more of your colleagues up there will be on the channel than they will here, right? It's just, it's heavily saturated up there. So yeah, it could be more effective because more people are using it. but. I don't think that should scare you. I mean, the way it's growing now and, and the saturation, the way it's spreading, I think that it's only a matter of time. I haven't really seen any problems with that here. And I have clients in all kinds of industries and nobody says, oh, I tried LinkedIn, it didn't work. Even if you've got 10 people in your, you know, in your connections, work with those connections. Who do they know? You know? How can you build that, that network? And LinkedIn is really about growing like this. You know, whether you're here or here, it's, it's about who you know and working those relationships. And, that can happen even with us in this room if we were the only connections we had.